Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 170, Athanasius's On the Nicene Council, Part 2. In this episode, we hear more from St. Athanasius, specifically chapters 4 through 7 of his On the Nicene Council, also called Defense of the Nicene Definition. Here's where he really tries to complete his case against the people he calls Arians. Be a critical listener. Do his arguments make sense? Is his exposition of the Bible convincing? How much of this is sound argument and how much of it is bombast? In next week's episode, before we move on to other sources in this controversy, we'll pause and I'll give my own evaluation of some of these arguments. But take a crack yourself as you listen to the end of his book called On the Nicene Council. Over then to Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, writing in the early 350s. But come now, let's act on the offensive and call on them for an answer. For now is fair time when their own ground has failed them to question them on our ground. Perhaps it may abash the perverse and reveal to them from where they have fallen. For we have learned from divine scripture that the Son of God, as was said above, is the very word and wisdom of the Father. For the apostle says, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And John, after saying, and the word was made flesh, at once adds, And we saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, so that the Word, being the only begotten Son, in this Word and in wisdom, heaven and earth and all that therein were made. And of this wisdom that God is fountain, we have learned from Baruch, by Israel's being charged with having forsaken the fountain of wisdom. If then they deny Scripture, they are at once aliens to their name, and may fitly be called of all men atheists and Christ's enemies, for they have brought upon themselves these names. But if they agree with us that the sayings of Scriptures are divinely inspired, let them dare to say openly what they think in secret, that God was once wordless and wisdomless. And let them in their madness say, There was once when he was not, and before his generation Christ was not, And again, let them declare that the fountain begat not wisdom from itself, but acquired it from without, till they have the daring to say, The sun came of nothing, from which it will follow that there is no longer a fountain, but a sort of pool, as if receiving water from without, and usurping the name of fountain. How full of irreligion this is, no one can doubt who has even the smallest understanding. But since they mutter something about word and wisdom being only names of the Son, we must ask them, if these are only names of the Son, he must be something else beside them. And if he is higher than the names, it is not lawful for the lesser to denote the higher. And if he be less than the names, yet he surely must have in him the principle of this more honorable name. And this implies his advance, which is an irreligion equal to anything that has gone before. For he who is in the Father, and in whom also the Father is, who says, I and the Father are one, whom he that has seen has seen the Father, to say that he has been exalted by anything external is the extreme of madness. However, when they are beaten in this way, and like Eusebius and his fellows are in these great straits, then they have this remaining plea, which Arius too, in ballads and in his own Thalia, fabled as a new difficulty. God speaks many words. Which then of these are we to call son and word only begotten of the Father? Senseless and anything but Christians. For first, on using such language about God, they conceive of him almost as a man, speaking and reversing his first words by his second, just as if one word from God were not sufficient for the framing of all things at the Father's will and for his providential care of all. For his speaking many words would argue a feebleness in them all, each needing the service of the other. 
But that God should have one word, which is the true doctrine, both shows the power of God and the perfection of the word that is from him and the religious understanding of them who thus believe. Oh, that they would consent to confess the truth from this their own statement, for if they once grant that God produces words, they plainly know him to be a father, and acknowledging this, let them consider that, while they are loath to ascribe one word to God, they are imagining that he is father of many, and while they are loath to say that there is no word of God at all, yet they do not confess that he is the Son of God, which is ignorance of the truth and inexperience in divine scripture. For if God is father of a word at all, wherefore is not he that is begotten a son? And again, who should be son of God but his word? For there are not many words, or each would be imperfect, but one is the word, that he only may be perfect, and because God being one, his image too must be one, which is the son. For the son of God, as may be learnt from the divine oracles themselves, is himself the word of God, and the wisdom and the image, and the hand, and the power. For God's offspring is one, and of the generation from the Father these titles are tokens. For if you say, the Son, you have declared what is from the Father by nature. And if you think of the Word, you are thinking again of what is from Him, and what is inseparable. And speaking of wisdom, again, you mean just as much what is not from without, but from him and in him. And if you name the power and the hand, again, you speak of what is proper to essence. And speaking of the image, you signify the son for what else is like God, but the offspring from him. Doubtless the things which came to be through the word, these are founded in wisdom, and what are founded in wisdom, these are all made by the hand and came to be through the Son. And we have proof of this, not from any external sources, but from the scriptures. For God himself says by Isaiah the prophet, My hand also has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. And again, I will cover you in the shadow of my hand, by which I planted the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. And David being taught this, and knowing that the Lord's hand was nothing else than wisdom, says in the psalm, In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creation. Solomon also received the same from God and said, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. And John, knowing that the word was the hand and the wisdom, preached, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. And the apostle, seeing that the hand and the wisdom and the word was nothing else than the Son, says, God, who at various times and in diverse manners spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he's appointed heir of all things by whom he made the ages. And again, there is one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through him. And knowing also that the Word, the Wisdom, the Son Himself was the image of the Father, he says in the letter to the Colossians, giving thanks to God and the Father, which has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption, even the remission of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by Him all things were created, which are in heaven and which are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. For as all things are created by the word, so because he is the image, are they also created in him. And thus anyone who directs his thoughts to the Lord will avoid stumbling upon the stone of offense, but rather will go forward to the brightness in the light of truth, for this is really the doctrine of truth. Though these contentious men burst with spite, neither religious toward God nor abashed at their confutation.
Now Eusebius and his fellows were at the former period examined at great length and convicted themselves, as I said before. On this they subscribed, and after this change of mind they kept in quiet and retirement. But since the present party, in the fresh arrogance of irreligion and in dizziness about the truth, are full set upon accusing the council, let them tell us what are the sort of scriptures from which they have learned, or who is the saint by whom they have been taught, that they have heaped together the phrases, out of nothing, and he was not before his generation, and once he was not, and alterable, and pre-existence, and at the will, which are their fables in mockery of the Lord." For the blessed Paul in his letter to the Hebrews says, By faith we understand that the ages were framed by the word of God, so that that which is seen was not made of things which do appear. But nothing is common to the word with the ages. For he it is who is in existence before the ages, by whom also the ages came to be. And in the shepherd it is written, since they allege this book also, though it is not of the canon, First of all, believe that God is one who created all things and arranged them and brought all things from nothing into being. But this again does not relate to the Son, for it speaks concerning all things which came to be through Him, from whom He is distinct. For it is not possible to reckon the framer of all with the things made by Him, unless a man is so beside himself as to say that the architect also is the same as the buildings which he brings up. Why then, when they have invented on their part unscriptural phrases for the purposes of irreligion, do they accuse those who are religious in their use of them? For irreligiousness is utterly forbidden, though it be attempted to disguise it with artful expressions and plausible sophisms. But religiousness is confessed by all to be lawful, even though presented in strange phrases, provided only they are used with a religious view and a wish to make them the expression of religious thoughts. Now the aforesaid groveling phrases of Christ's enemies have been shown in these remarks to be both formerly and now replete with irreligion, whereas the definition of the counsel against them, if accurately examined, will be found to be altogether a representation of the truth and especially if diligent attention be paid to the occasion which gave rise to these expressions, which was reasonable and was as follows. The council, wishing to do away with the irreligious phrases of the Arians, and to use instead the acknowledged words of scriptures, that the Son is not from nothing, but from God, and is word and wisdom, and not creature or work, but a proper offspring from the father, Eusebius and his fellows, led by their inveterate heterodoxy, understood the phrase from God as belonging to us, as if in respect to it, the word of God differed nothing from us, and that because it is written, there is one God from whom are all things, and again, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new, and all things are from God. But the fathers, perceiving their craft and the cunning of their irreligion, were forced to express more distinctly the sense of the words, from God. Accordingly, they wrote, from the essence of God, in order that from God might not be considered common and equal in the Son and in things originate, but that all others might be acknowledged as creatures and the word alone as from the Father. For though all things be said to be from God, yet this is not the sense in which the Son is from Him. For as to the creatures of God is said of them on this account, in that they exist not at random or spontaneously, nor come to be by chance, according to those philosophers who refer them to the combination of atoms and to elements of similar structure, nor as certain heretics speak of a distinct framer. Nor as others again say that the constitution of all things is from certain angels, but in that, whereas God is, it was by him that all things were brought into being, not being before, through his word. But as to the word, since he is not a creature, he alone is both called and is from the Father. And it is significant of this sense to say that the Son is from the essence of the Father, for to nothing originate does this attach. In truth, when Paul says that all things are from God, he immediately adds, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, 
in order to show all men that the Son is other than all these things which came to be from God. For the things which came to be from God came to be through his Son, and that he had used his foregoing words with reference to the world as framed by God, and not as if all things were from the Father as the Son is. For neither are other things as the Son, nor is the Word one among others, for he is Lord and Framer of all. And for this reason did the Holy Council expressly declare that he was of the essence of the Father, that we might believe the Word to be other than the nature of things originate, being alone truly from God, and that no trickery should be left open to the irreligious. This, then, was the reason why the Council wrote, Of the Essence. Again, when the bishop said that the Word must be described as the true power and image of the Father, in all things exact and like the Father, and as unalterable, and as always, and as in Him without division, for never was the Word not, but He was always existing everlastingly with the Father as the radiance of light, Eusebius and his fellows endured indeed, as not daring to contradict, being put to shame by the arguments which were urged against them. But then they were caught whispering to each other and winking with their eyes that like and always and power and in him were, as before, common to us and the Son, and that it was no difficulty to agree to these. And as to like, they said that it is written of us, man is the image and glory of God, always that it was written, for we which live are always. As to the phrase in him, they quoted, in him we live and move and have our being. As to unalterable, they quoted, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. As to power, that the caterpillar and the locust are called power and great power, and that it is often said of the people, for instance, all the power of the Lord came out of the land of Egypt. And there are others also, heavenly ones, for Scripture says, the Lord of powers is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Indeed, Asterius, by title the Sophist, has said the like in writing, having learned it from them, and before him, Arius, having learned it also, as has been said, But the bishops discerning in this, too, their dishonesty, and whereas it is written, deceit is in the heart of the irreligious that imagine evil, were again compelled on their part to collect the sense of the scriptures and to re-say and re-write what they had said before more distinctly still, namely that the Son is one in essence with the Father by way of signifying that the Son was from the Father, and not merely like, but the same in likeness, and of showing that the Son's likeness and unalterableness was different from such copy of the same as is ascribed to us, which we acquire from virtue on the ground of observance of the commandments. For bodies which are like each other may be separated and become at distances from each other, as are human sons relatively to their parents." As it is written concerning Adam and Seth, who was begotten of him, that he was like him after his own pattern. But since the generation of the Son from the Father is not according to the nature of men, and not only like, but also inseparable from the essence of the Father, and he and the Father are one, as he has said himself, and the Word is ever in the Father, and the Father in the Word, as the radiance stands towards the light, for this the phrase itself indicates, therefore... The council, as understanding this, suitably wrote, one in essence, that they might both defeat the perverseness of the heretics and show that the word was other than originated things. For after thus writing, they at once added, But they who say that the Son of God is from nothing, or created, or alterable, or a work, or from other essence, these the holy Catholic Church anathematizes. And by saying this, they showed clearly that of the essence and one in essence are destructive of those catchwords of irreligion, such as created and work and originated and alterable, and he was not before his generation. And he who holds these contradicts the council, but he who does not hold with Arius must needs hold and intend the decisions of the council suitably regarding them to signify the relation of the radiance to the light, and from this gaining the illustration of the truth. 
Therefore, if they, as the others, make an excuse that the terms are strange, let them consider the sense in which the council so wrote and anathematize what the council anathematized, and then, if they can, let them find fault with the expressions. But I well know that, if they hold the sense of the council, they will fully accept the terms in which it is conveyed, whereas if it be the sense which they wish to complain of, all must see that it is idle in them to discuss the wording when they are but seeking handles for irreligion. This, then, was the reason of these expressions, but if they still complain that such are not scriptural, that very complaint is a reason why they should be cast out as talking idly and disordered in mind. And let them blame themselves in this matter, for they set the example, beginning their war against God with words not in Scripture. However, if a person is interested in the question, let him know that even if the expressions are not in so many words in the scriptures, yet, as was said before, they contain the sense of the scriptures, and expressing it, they convey it to those who have their hearing unimpaired for religious doctrine. Now, you should consider this circumstance, and those ill-instructed men should listen to it. It has been shown above, and must be believed as true, that the Word is from the Father, and the only offspring proper to Him and natural. From where may one conceive the Son to be, who is the wisdom and the Word, in whom all things came to be, but from God Himself? However, the scriptures also teach us this, since the Father says by David, My heart uttered a good word. And, from the womb before the morning star I begat thee. And the Son signifies to the Jews about himself, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth from the Father. And again, not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. And moreover, I and my Father are one, and I and the Father, and the Father in me, is equivalent to the saying, I am from the Father and inseparable from Him. And John, in saying the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared Him, spoke of what he had learned from the Savior. Besides, what else does in the bosom intimate but the Son's genuine generation from the Father? If then anyone thinks God to be a compound, as accident is in essence, or to have any external development, and to be encompassed, or as if there is anything about him which completes the essence, so that when we say God, or name Father, we do not signify the invisible and incomprehensible essence, but something about it, then let them complain of the counsels stating that the Son was from the essence of God. But let them reflect that in thus considering they utter two blasphemies, for they make God bodily, and they falsely say that the Lord is not Son of the very Father, but of what is about Him. But if God is simple as He is, it follows that in saying God and naming Father we name nothing as if about Him, but signify His essence itself. For though it's impossible to comprehend what the essence of God is, yet if we only understand that God is, and if Scripture indicates Him by means of these titles, we, with the intention of indicating Him and none else, call Him God and Father and Lord. When then He says, I am that I am, and I am the Lord God, or when Scripture says God, we understand nothing else by it but the intimation of His incomprehensible essence itself, and that he is who is spoken of. Therefore let no one be startled on hearing that the Son of God is from the essence of the Father, but rather let him accept the explanation of the fathers, who in more explicit but equivalent language have for from God written of the essence. For they consider it the same thing to say that the word was of God and of the essence of God, Since the word God, as I have already said, signifies nothing but the essence of him who is, if then the word is not in such sense from God as a son, genuine and natural, from a father, but only as creatures because they are framed, and as all things are from God, then neither is he from the essence of the father, 
nor is the Son again Son according to essence, but in consequence of virtue, as we who are called sons by grace. But if he only is from God as genuine Son as he is, then the Son may reasonably be called from the essence of God. Again, the illustration of the light and the radiance has this meaning. For the saints have not said that the word was related to God as fire kindled from the heat of the sun, which is commonly put out again. This is an external work and a creature of its author. But they all preach of him as radiance, thereby to signify his being from the essence, proper and indivisible, and his oneness with the Father. This also will secure his true unchangeableness and immutability, for how can these be his unless he be proper offspring of the Father's essence? For this too must be taken to confirm his sameness with his own Father. Our explanation then having so religious an aspect, Christ's enemy should not be startled at the one in essence either since this term also has a sound sense and good reasons. Indeed, if we say that the word is from the essence of God, for after what has been said, this must be a phrase admitted by them, what does this mean but the truth and eternity of the essence from which he is begotten? For it is not different in kind, lest it be combined with the essence of God as something foreign and unlike it. Nor is he like only outwardly, lest he seem in some respect or wholly to be other in essence, as brass shines like gold and silver like tin. For these are foreign and of other nature, and separated off from each other in nature and powers. Nor is brass proper to gold, nor is the pigeon born from the dove. But though they are considered like, yet they differ in essence." If it's like this with the Son, let him be a creature as we are, and not one in essence. But if the Son is word, wisdom, image of the Father, radiance, he must in all reason be one in essence. For unless it be proved that he is not from God, but an instrument different in nature and different in essence, surely the counsel was sound in its doctrine and correct in its decree. Further, let every bodily inference be banished on this subject, and transcending every imagination of sense, let us with pure understanding and with mind alone apprehend the genuine relation of Son to Father, and the Word's proper relation towards God, and the unvarying likeness of the radiance towards the light. For as the words offspring and Son bear, and are meant to bear no human sense, but one suitable to God, in like manner, when we hear the phrase, one in essence, Let us not fall upon human senses and imagine partitions and divisions of the divine nature, but as having our thoughts directed to things immaterial, let us preserve undivided the oneness of nature and the sameness of light. For this is proper to a son as regards a father, and in this is shown that God is truly father of the word. Here again the illustration of light and its radiance is to the point. Who will presume to say that the radiance is unlike and foreign to the sun? Rather, who, thus considering the radiance relative to the sun and the sameness of the light, would not say with confidence, truly the light and the radiance are one, and the one is manifested in the other, and the radiance is in the sun, so that whoever sees this sees that also. But such a oneness and natural property, what should it be named by those who believe and see rightly, but offspring, one in essence? And God's offspring, what should we fittingly and suitably consider, but word and wisdom and power, which is a sin to say is foreign to the Father, and it's a crime even to imagine it as other than with him everlastingly. For by this offspring the Father made all things, and extended his providence to all things. By him he exercises his love to man, and thus he and the Father are one, as has been said. Unless indeed these perverse men make a fresh attempt, and say that the essence of the word is not the same as the light which is in him from the Father, as if the light and the Son were one with the Father, but he himself for an essence and being a creature... This is simply the belief of Caiaphas, the Jewish priest, and Paul of Samosata, who the church cast out. But these now are disguising, and by this they fell from the truth and were declared to be heretics. 
For if he partakes in the fullness of light from the Father, why is he not rather that which others partake, that there be no medium introduced between him and the Father? Otherwise it is no longer clear that all things were generated by the Son, but by him of whom he too partakes. And if this is the Word, the wisdom of the Father, in whom the Father is revealed and known, and frames the world, and without whom the Father does nothing, evidently He it is who is from the Father. For all things originated partake of Him, as partaking of the Holy Ghost. And being such, He cannot be from nothing, nor a creature at all, but rather a proper offspring from the Father, as the radiance from light. This, then, is the sense in which they who met at Nicaea made use of these expressions. But next, that they did not invent them for themselves, since this is one of their excuses, but spoke what they had received from their predecessors, I will proceed to prove this, too, to cut off even this excuse from them. Know then, O Arians, enemies of Christ, that Theonostus, learned man, did not decline the phrase of the essence. For in the second book of his Hypotyposes, he writes thus of the Son, The essence of the Son is not one procured from without, nor accruing out of nothing, but it sprang from the Father's essence as the radiance of light, as the vapor of water, and neither the radiance nor the vapor is the water itself or the sun itself, nor is it alien. But it is an effluence of the Father's essence, which, however, suffers no partition. For as the sun remains the same, and is not impaired by the rays poured forth by it, so neither does the Father's essence suffer change, though it has the sun as an image of itself. Theonostus then, after previously investigating in the way of an exercise, proceeds to lay down his views in the words above. Next, Dionysius, who was bishop of Alexandria, upon his writing against Sibelius and expounding at large the Savior's economy according to the flesh, and from this proving against the Sibelians that not the Father but his word became flesh, as John has said, was suspected of saying that the Son was a thing made and originated, and not one in essence with the Father. On this he writes to his namesake Dionysius, bishop of Rome, to allege in his defense that this was a slander upon him, and he assured him that he had not called the son made, but instead confessed him to be even one in essence. And his words ran thus, And I have written in another letter a refutation of the false charge they bring against me, that I deny that Christ was one in essence with God. For though I say that I have not found this term anywhere in Holy Scripture, yet my remarks which follow, and which they have not noticed, are not inconsistent with that belief. For I instanced human birth as being evidently homogeneous, and I observe that, undeniably, parents differed from their children only in not being the same individuals, otherwise there could be neither parents nor children." And my letter, as I said before, owing to present circumstances, I am unable to produce, or I would have sent you the very words I used, or rather a copy of it all, which, if I have an opportunity, I will do still. But I am sure from recollection that I adduced parallels of things kindred with each other. For instance, that a plant grown from seed or from root was other than that from which it sprang, yet was altogether one in nature with it and that a stream flowing from a fountain gained a new name, for that neither the fountain was called stream nor the stream fountain, and both existed, and the stream was the water from the fountain. And that the word of God is not a work or a creature, but an offspring proper to the Father's essence and indivisible, as the great council wrote, here you may see in the words of Dionysius, bishop of Rome, who while writing against the Sibelians, thus inveighs against those who dared to say so. 
Next, I may reasonably turn to those who divide and cut to pieces and destroy the most sacred doctrine of the Church of God, making it, as it were, three powers and partitive subsistences and three divine natures. I am told that some among you who are catechists and teachers of the divine word take the lead in this tenet, who are diametrically opposed, so to speak, to Sibelius's opinions, for he blasphemously says that the Son is the Father, and the Father the Son, but they in some sort preach three gods, as dividing the sacred monad into three subsistences foreign to each other and utterly separate, for it must be that the divine word is united with the God of the universe." and the Holy Ghost must rest and live in God. Thus in one as a summit, I mean the God of the universe, must the divine triad be gathered up and brought together. For it is the doctrine of the presumptuous Marcion to sever and divide the divine monarchy into three origins, a devil's teaching, not that of Christ's true disciples and lovers of the Savior's lessons. For they know well that a triad is preached by the divine scripture, but that neither Old Testament nor New preaches three gods. Equally, one must censure those who hold the Son to be a work, and consider that the Lord has come into being as one of the things which really came to be, whereas the divine oracles witness to a generation suitable to him in becoming, but not to any fashioning or making. A blasphemy then it is, not ordinary, but even the highest, to say that the Son is in any sort a handiwork. For if he came to be son, once he was not, but he was always, if, that is, he be in the Father, as he says himself, and if the Christ be word and wisdom and power, which, as you know, divine scripture says, and these attributes be powers of God. If then the Son came into being, once these attributes were not. Consequently, there was a time when God was without them, which is most absurd, and why say more on all these points to you, men full of the Spirit, and well aware of the absurdities which come to view from saying that the Son is a work? Not attending, as I consider, to this circumstance, the authors of this opinion have entirely missed the truth in explaining, contrary to the sense of divine and prophetic scripture in the passage, the words, The Lord created me a beginning of his ways to his works. For the meaning of he created, as you know, is not one. For we must understand he created in this place as he set over the works made by him, that is, made by the Son himself. And he created here must not be taken for made, creating differs from making. Is not he your father that has bought you? Has he not made you and created you, says Moses in his great song in Deuteronomy? And one may say to them, O reckless men, is he a work, who is the firstborn of every creature, who is born from the womb before the morning star, who said as wisdom, Before all the hills he begets me. And in many passages of the divine oracles is the Son said to have been generated, but nowhere to have come into being, which manifestly convicts those of misconception about the Lord's generation, who presume to call his divine and ineffable generation a making. Neither, then, may we divide into three divine natures the wonderful and divine monad, nor disparage with the name of work the dignity and exceeding majesty of the Lord, but we must believe in God the Father Almighty, and in Christ Jesus his Son, and in the Holy Ghost, and hold that to the God of the universe the Word is united. For I, says he, and the Father are one, and I in the Father, and the Father in me. For thus both the divine triad and the holy preaching of the monarchy will be preserved." Thus Dionysius, bishop of Rome, and concerning the everlasting coexistence of the word with the Father, and that he is not of another essence or subsistence proper to the fathers, as the bishops in the council said, you may also hear from the labor-loving origin for what he has written as if inquiring and by way of exercise, that let no one take as expressive of his own sentiments, but of parties who are contending in investigation, but what he definitely declares, that is the sentiment of the labor-loving man. After his prolusions, then, so to speak, against the heretics, straight away he introduces his personal belief thus. If there be an image of the invisible God, it is an invisible image. 
And I will be bold to add that, as being the likeness of the Father, never was it not. For when was that God, who according to John is called light, for God is light, without a radiance of his proper glory, that a man should presume to assert the Son's origin of existence, as if before he were not? But when was not that image of the Father's ineffable and nameless and unutterable subsistence, that expression and word, and he that knows the Father? For let him understand well who dares to say, once the Son was not, that he is saying, once wisdom was not, and word was not, and life was not. And again elsewhere Origen says, but it is not innocent nor without peril, if because of our weakness of understanding we deprive God, as far as in us lies, of the only begotten word ever coexisting with him, and the wisdom in which he rejoiced, else he must be conceived as not always possessed of joy. See, we are proving that this view has been transmitted from father to father. And you, O modern Jews and disciples of Caiaphas, how many fathers can you assign to your phrases? Not one of the understanding and wise, for all abhor you, but the devil alone, none but he is your father in this apostasy, who both in the beginning sowed you with the seed of this irreligion, and now persuades you to slander the ecumenical council, for committing to writing not your doctrines, but that which from the beginning those who were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have handed down to us. For the faith which the council has confessed in writing, that is the faith of the Catholic Church. To assert this, the Blessed Fathers so expressed themselves while condemning the Arian heresy, and this is a chief reason why these apply themselves to slander the Council. For it is not the terms which trouble them, but that those terms prove them to be heretics and presumptuous beyond other heresies. This, in fact, was the reason when the unsound nature of their phrases had been exposed at that time, and they were henceforth open to the charge of irreligion, that they proceeded to borrow of the Greeks the term unoriginate, that under the shelter of it they might reckon among the things originated and the creatures that word of God by whom these very things came to be. So unblushing are they in their irreligion, so obstinate in their blasphemies against the Lord." If then this lack of shame arises from ignorance of the term, they ought to have learned of those who gave it to them, and who have not scrupled to say that even intellect, which they derive from good, and the soul, which proceeds from intellect, though their respective origins be known, are notwithstanding unoriginated, for they understand that by so saying they do not disparage that first origin of which the others come." This being the case, let them say the like themselves, or else not speak at all of what they do not know. But if they consider that they are acquainted with the subject, then they must be interrogated. For the expression is not from the divine scripture, but they are contentious as elsewhere for unscriptural positions. Just as I have related the reason and sense with which the Council and the Fathers before it defined and published of the essence and one in essence agreeably to what Scripture says of the Savior, so now let them, if they can, answer on their part what has led them to this unscriptural phrase and in what sense they call God unoriginated. In truth, I am told that the name has different senses. Philosophers say that it means first what has not yet but may come to be, Next, what neither exists nor can come into being. And thirdly, what exists indeed, but was neither originated nor had origin of being, but is everlasting and indestructible. Now perhaps they will wish to pass over the first two senses from the absurdity which follows, for according to the first, things that already have come to be and things that are expected to come to be are unoriginated, and the second is more absurd still, accordingly they will proceed to the third sense and use the word in it. Though here, in this sense too, their irreligion will be quite as great. For if by unoriginated they mean what has no origin of being, nor is originated or created, but eternal, and say that the word of God is contrary to this, who comprehends not the craftiness of these enemies of God? 
Who would but stone such madmen? For when they are ashamed to bring forward again those first two phrases which they fabled and which were condemned, the wretches have taken another way to signify them by means of what they call unoriginate. For if the Son be of things originate, it follows that he too came to be from nothing. And if he has an origin in being, then he was not before his generation. And if he is not eternal, there was once when he was not. If these are their sentiments, they ought to signify their heterodoxy in their own phrases, and not hide their perverseness under the cloak of the unoriginate. But instead of this, the evil-minded men do all things with craftiness like their father, the devil. For as he attempts to deceive in the guise of others, so these have broached the term unoriginate, that they might pretend to speak piously of God, yet might cherish a concealed blasphemy against the Lord, and under a veil might teach it to others. However, on the detecting of this sophism, what remains to them? We have found another, say the evildoers, and they proceed to add to what they have said already, that unoriginate means what has no author of being, but stands itself in this relation to things originated. Unthankful and in truth deaf to the scriptures, who do everything and say everything not to honor God, but to dishonor the Son, ignorant that he who dishonors the Son dishonors the Father. For first, even though they denote God in this way, still the word is not proved to be of things originated. For again, as being an offspring of the essence of the Father, he is of consequence with him eternally. For this name of offspring does not detract from the nature of the word, nor does unoriginated take its sense from contrast with the Son, but with the things which come to be through the Son. And as he who addresses an architect and calls him framer of house or city does not under this designation allude to the son who is begotten of him, but on account of the art and science which he displays in his work, calls him artificer, signifying thereby that he is not such as the things made by him, and while he knows the nature of the builder, knows also that he whom he begets is other than his works... And in regard to his son, calls him father, but in regard to his works, creator and maker, in like manner, he who says in this sense that God is unoriginate, names him from his works, signifying not only that he is not originated, but that he is maker of things which are so. Yet is of course aware that the word is other than the things originate, and alone a proper offspring of the father, through whom all things came to be and consist. In like manner, when the prophets spoke of God as all-ruling, they did not so name him as if the word were included in that all, for they knew that the Son was other than things originated and sovereign over them himself, according to his likeness to the Father. But because he is ruler over all things which through the Son he has made, and has given the authority of all things to the Son, and having given it is himself once more the Lord of all things through the word." Again, when they called God Lord of the powers, they didn't say this as if the word was one of those powers, but because while he is father of the Son, he is Lord of the powers which through the Son have come to be. For again, the word too, as being in the Father, is Lord of them all and sovereign over all. For all things whatsoever the Father has are the Son's. This then being the force of such titles, in like manner let a man call God unoriginated, if it so please him, not, however, as if the word were of originated things, but because, as I said before, God not only is not originated, but through his proper word is he the maker of things which are so. For though the Father be called such, still the word is the Father's image, and one in essence with him. And being his image, he must be distinct from things originated and from everything, for whose image he is, his property and likeness he has. So that he who calls the Father unoriginated and almighty perceives in the unoriginated and the almighty his word and his wisdom, which is the Son. But these wondrous men, eager for irreligion, hit upon the term unoriginated, not as caring for God's honor, but from malevolence toward the Savior, 
for if they had regard to honor and reverent language, it rather had been right and good to acknowledge and to call God Father than to give him this name, for in calling God unoriginated, they are, as I said before, calling him from things which came to be, and as a maker only, that so they may imply the word to be a work after their own pleasure. But he who calls God Father in him withal signifies his Son also, and cannot fail to know that, whereas there is a Son, through this Son all things that came to be were created. Therefore, it will be much more accurate to denote God from the Son, and to call him Father, than to name him and call him unoriginated from his works only. For the latter term refers to the works that have come to be at the will of God through the Word, But the name Father points out the proper offspring from his essence. And whereas the word surpasses things originated, by so much and more also does calling God Father surpass calling him unoriginated. For the latter is non-scriptural and suspicious, as it has various meanings. But the former is simple and scriptural, and more accurate, and alone implies the Son. And unoriginated is a word of the Greeks who know not the Son. But Father has been acknowledged and vouchsafed by our Lord, for he, knowing himself whose son he was, said, I in the Father, and the Father in me, and he that has seen me has seen the Father, and I and the Father are one. But nowhere is he found to call the Father unoriginated. Moreover, when he teaches us to pray, he says not, When you pray, say, O God, unoriginated, but rather, when you pray, say, Our Father who is in heaven. And it was his will that the summary of our faith should have the same bearing. For he has bid us to be baptized, not in the name of unoriginate and originate, not in the name of uncreate and creature, but into the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For with such an initiation we too are made sons verily, and using the name of the Father, we acknowledge from that name the word in the Father. But if he wills that we should call his own Father our Father, we must not on that account measure ourselves with the Son according to nature, for it is because of the Son that the Father is so called by us. For since the Word bore our body and came to be in us, Therefore, by reason of the word in us is God called our Father. For the Spirit of the word in us names through us his own Father as ours, which is the Apostle's meaning when he says, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. But perhaps being refuted as touching the term unoriginate also, they will say, according to their evil nature, It behooved, as regards our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ also, to state from the Scriptures what is there written of Him, and not to introduce non-scriptural expressions. Yes, it behooved, say I too, for the tokens of truth are more exact as drawn from the Scriptures than from other sources. But the ill disposition and the versatile and crafty irreligion of Eusebius and his fellows compelled the bishops, as I said before, to publish more distinctly the terms which overthrew their religion. And what the council did write has already been shown to have an orthodox sense, while the Arians have been shown to be corrupt in their phrases and evil in their dispositions. The term unoriginate, having its own sense, and admitting of a religious sense, they nevertheless, according to their own idea, and as they will, use for the dishonor of the Savior, all for the sake of contentiously maintaining, like giants, their fight with God. But as they did not escape condemnation when they adduced these former phrases, so when they misconceive of the unoriginated, which in itself admits of being used well and religiously, they were detected being disgraced before all and their heresy everywhere proscribed. This then, as I could, I have related by way of explaining what was formerly done in the council, but I know that the contentious among Christ's enemies will not be disposed to change even after hearing this, but will ever search about for other pretenses and for others again after those. For as the prophet speaks, if the Ethiopian changes his skin or the leopard his spots, then will they be willing to think religiously who have been instructed in irreligion. You, however, beloved, on receiving this, read it by yourself, 
and if you approve of it, read it also to the brothers who happen to be present, that they too, on hearing it, may welcome the council's zeal for truth and the exactness of its sense, and may condemn that of Christ's enemies, the Arians, and the futile pretenses for which the sake of their irreligious heresy they have been at pains to frame among themselves, because to God and the Father is due the glory, honor, and worship with his coexistent Son and Word, together with the all-holy and life-giving Spirit, now and unto endless ages. Amen. This week's thinking music has been We Silently Surf the Gentle Sun, featuring Blue Wave Theory, by Ivan Chu. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to and download the entire track. If you enjoyed this episode of the Trinity's Podcast, don't forget to share on social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. And if you haven't already, would you consider giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country? Doing this will help other people find out about the podcast. Join us next week when I analyze Athanasius' arguments in this book. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time. Don't forget to love God with all your mind.